Welcome to Conline Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about. <coughs> <coughs> Welcome to Conline Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Leesley, and in this episode, we'll be looking at an engineered set of lenses, the IS language. The name the IS language, capitalized like a title with IS in all caps, is a longer form of this language's actual name. IS, variously written either in all caps or with just the first letter capitalized. And yes, it's pronounced exactly the same as the English word IS. Anyway, IS is an ongoing art project made by Stuart Davis over the course of several years, presented online in the form of a YouTube video released in 2014. Outside of videos on Stuart's YouTube channel, there's also a short description of the language on his website which promises, but does not link to, more to come, and several examples of things he's done with the language across his various social media accounts. The IS language is a personal philosophical language, designed as a way of thinking about the world. It's not for communication, but rather for the expression of emotional experiences. The emotional experiences is is made for are specifically difficult to explain in English, and therefore, Stuart argues, difficult to think about. Is is designed for personal use in art, and isn't described anywhere comprehensively, unless that's just buried somewhere in one of his Patreon posts. Therefore, all the information about is I'm using for this review come from these two YouTube videos, a handful of blog posts, and analyzing the corpus of text written in the language. I did make an attempt to reach out to Stuart for further information, but at the time of writing, he hasn't given me any. Needless to say, this is going to all be far more speculative than I usually get in these episodes. The is language's consonants are m, nya, b, d, g, b, d, s, sh, z, j, l, r, a. Now, Stuart is happy to point out that he is not a linguist. He is also happy to point out that, quote, By the way, I have a terrible accent in is. Given this, I applaud him for actually bothering to use the International Phonetic Alphabet. Now, if you're familiar with what sorts of consonant inventories are common across different languages, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that this inventory isn't exactly typical. This inventory seems like one which was created based on what things could sound cool rather than building a whole cohesive system. As a result, it's pretty asymmetric, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. After all, natural languages have asymmetric inventories all the time. So yes, despite its irregularities, I can for the most part accept this as being a consonant inventory which conceivably could show up in a natural language, with the one glaring exception of that bilabial click. You know, about click consonants, right? They're not very common, but the languages that they appear in tend to have a lot of them. As far as I can tell, there are no natural languages that have exactly one click, and bilabial clicks themselves are uncommon for click consonants. That's why that bilabial click is a clear giveaway that Stuart wasn't exactly worried about the his language feeling natural. The is language's vowels are e, a, u, e, e, a, o, a, oi. Uh, I, I'll. Just like the consonant inventory, Is's vowel inventory isn't super cohesive, but it's not like completely unbelievable or anything. Some things worth noting include how the E, U, A corners of vowel space are pretty much avoided outside of diphthongs, how those central vowels sound pretty darn similar, and how those two high front vowels are literally identical. I can't know for sure what the difference between these two phonemes is supposed to be. Those subscript numbers are my own addition, because on Stuart's handy chart here, they're both transcribed the same way. I'm pretty sure they're supposed to be different things and not just one sound written two separate ways, because they're there's this whole paragraph on his blog about how important it is that everything in is is spelled how it sounds, and that there's, quote, only one sound associated with each phoneme. One solution I considered for this issue of differentiating between these two vowels was to analyze the pronunciations of one of the existing examples of Stuart speaking the is language, which led me to the conclusion that I2 is probably supposed to be higher than I1. But then I remembered that thing he said about how he doesn't actually speak it with fully accurate pronunciation, which implies that I can't actually rely on that. So, small capital I subscript 1 and small capital I subscript 2 is what they'll have to be. I think this phonology suits is decently enough. It's clearly an amateur creation, but for what is is, it works. It functions as a mean of allowing the creation of words that sound pretty. If it weren't for that bilabial click, I'd even say I think it's kind of decent. I am, however, somewhat skeptical of if I'm interpreting it as intended. Stewart's so-called accent when speaking is involves some rather peculiar things, like this specific vowel being pronounced like a sibilant. Does that imply that this is actually supposed to be je, which is written in the IPA with a letter that looks somewhat similar? Well, because these sounds qualities are never described, and because Stuart explicitly stated that his pronunciations aren't canonical, I'm going to continue to assume that this is meant to be a central vowel and not a sibilant. One of the main things Stuart's done with the is language since creating it has been calligraphy using its writing system. I've already shown you this image which defines it. The is language's alphabet has a pretty nice aesthetic, and the calligraphy that's been made with it does indeed look good. It's somewhat of a featural system in that similar sounds are represented with similar letters. Once again, the odd one out is the bilabial 
double click. I know it's hard to tell, but if you look closely, you just might notice that the letter of the is alphabet that represents this sound happens to be exactly the same thing as the corresponding letter of the International Phonetic Alphabet. Now, maybe this is just a hastily made chart. Maybe Stuart accidentally used the wrong character in his custom is alphabet font and didn't notice that the letter ended up displaying as the default font instead because it's a letter he's unfamiliar with. I think that's a nicer assumption to make rather than assume that he thought that this specific click letter would fit in with the rest of this alphabet completely unmodified. Once again, however, since this chart is one of the only publicly available pieces of canon information about is, I will proceed as if it were accurate, despite these various things which appear to be mistakes. Now, is has a romanization system, but I couldn't find a full description of it anywhere, just individual examples. Unfortunately, most examples of romanized is are presented without the same text in the IPA or in the is alphabet, like this excerpt. I'm guessing that the JZH trigraph in all of these words is meant to be is's only voice sibilant, yeah, because none of its components would make sense to be anything else, but look at that last example. Never mind that definition for now, just look at the way it's romanized. J-Z-H-I-T-I-H-Z-J? In context, it's significant that this word, when written in the is alphabet, is a palindrome, which I guess means that the romanization has to be a palindrome too? You know what? Here, I'm gonna make my own romanization phrase. Feel free to use this, Stuart. So for consonants, it's not that hard to make something mostly sensible with a one-to-one -one correlation between letters and sounds, but it's kinda unintuitive for a typical anglophonic non-linguist, so we can make a few adjustments to accommodate for that. I think this works. There's GN for the palatal nasal, like in some romance languages, MW for the bilabial click, because that's how you spell the kissing sound, Mwah. and everything else just has an obvious Englishy way of being spelled. Maybe replace J with ZH or something, but I think J is fine. Vowels are trickier because there's quite a few of them. The central vowels in particular are difficult to romanize just because of how similar they are. Here's the first idea I had. There's a few obvious problems with it. It's far from intuitive, the digraphs could be ambiguous in cases, and so on. This is specifically avoiding diacritics, which the current romanization also avoids. Allowing myself to use diacritics and other non-ASCII stuff, it's more manageable to create a romanization that actually works. Now, due to the relative inaccessibility of the is alphabet, from here on out I'm going to be using this romanization for the example text in this video, along with IPA and the official romanization where it's available. Most text in is are left untranslated, and the few exceptions are translated very loosely. There is also no public is dictionary, or for that matter, any large list of individual is words. Stuart has said, quote, the language is a work in progress, often in flux, so I don't post a ton of stuff online. I hope to publicly share the lexicon, grammar, allow folks to download the font I use to write in is, etc. So I can assume that eventually this information will be publicly available, but for now there is simply no way of knowing any meaningful information about is grammar. Because of this, I'll be merging the grammar portion with this review with the vocabulary portion. If Stuart does end up publishing a reference grammar for is, I might go back and redo this episode. For now though, this will have to do. The vocabulary of is is the aspect which Stuart Davis has talked about most extensively. Creating words for highly specific experiences is, I believe, the main reason is exists. Stuart describes is vocabulary in terms of its horizontal and vertical dimensions. What Stuart calls the horizontal dimension of a word is the fact that the antonym of a word can be formed by reversing it. So yes is opa, and no is upple. Connecting words with their antonyms is a common way of reducing the amount of basic roots in a conlang. Some auxlangs like Esperanto and Votgil use prefixes for this, and the musical language Solresol uses the same concept of reversal. From a philosophical standpoint, reversing a word to get its opposite is a more elegant way of doing this than using a prefix, because it doesn't imply either word in the pair to be the default, or make unintended connections between things within the antonym category. Words in is have two other quote-unquote directions, which are formed by taking the other two directions and combining them together. Together. These directions have meanings between the two cardinal meanings of the root in a somewhat irregular way. As is to be expected, there aren't many examples of this provided. Now it's important to emphasize that these sets shouldn't be thought of as groups of four separate related words, but rather one word as viewed from different perspectives. Stuart calls this idea bundled complementarity and says that something and its opposite sharing a root helps to emphasize the direct relationship to each other. Bundled complementarity is presented as an alternative to the viewpoint the English language assumes, which he refers to as subject-object duality. Now, as someone who knows somewhere between one and two things about linguistics, this confused me somewhat. As you know, English makes very little marked distinction between subjects and objects, only using separate words for pronouns and otherwise relying entirely on word order. So what does avoiding subject-object duality mean for is? Is there free word order with no marked cases? Are all verbs treated as reciprocal actions? Is is a language like Lojban, where it has various grammatical features that are given different names from what they're usually given to give the impression that it's doing something original? No, if is does any 
of these, it's very quiet about it. The term subject-object duality doesn't actually have anything to do with the grammatical concepts of the subject and object of a sentence. Instead, from what I can tell, it refers to a specific way of looking at reality where everything that isn't the self is lumped together into one not-self category. The duality is that I am the subject, and everything else is an object. I don't think there's anything about the English language which specifically connects it to this mindset. I also couldn't find anywhere where Stuart explained why he believes that the English language has this bias, or why having words and their antonyms be the same basic root prevents this. Googling subject-object duality, however, landed me on an explanation of the general concept which took time and space are not objectively real as a given, a Quora thread full of people debating whether physical objects are illusory, and a Futurama-themed Prezi slideshow before I found something that explained the connection to language by Robert Wolf. Quote, In a sentence structure, I see a tree, I, the observer, is the subject of the sentence. Tree, the observed, is the object. Such a sentence presupposes that I and the tree are separate entities. We think, in our mind, in sentences, so we habitually separate ourself, I, from every object we see. I, the thinker, am the subject of every thought we have, what the importance of the thought relates to. The object in the thought can be any of the things in existence, whether material or immaterial. We divide the world in our thoughts. There is me, always the important subject, and there is all else in existence that is not me, the object of our thoughts. This philosophical stuff is extremely far removed from my wheelhouse. While I, conditioned to think of everything dualistically, might think of this as being a separate wheelhouse, my wheelhouse being a subject and this wheelhouse being an object, this is only an illusion, and they are in fact the same wheelhouse, as are all wheelhouses and everything which is not a wheelhouse. In the is language, instead of distinguishing between in my wheelhouse and outside my wheelhouse, one is encouraged to be conscious of the fact that they are the same thing by distinguishing between in my wheelhouse and slightly whammy. Allegedly perpendicular to is's horizontal dimension is its vertical dimension. Roots in is can take one of seven affixes to indicate level of altitude, or the depth of perception. This is a suffix for inversion one and a prefix for inversion two. So what does any of this even mean? Quote, altitudes in is are a depth inflection, whereas most inflections denote person, number, gender, case. In is, there is a category of vertical value. Like inches, the altitude itself is empty. Inches could measure anything, rain, a person's height, the depth of soil, or the length of a fully erect penis. Altitudes follow of transcend include succession, integral semiotics. So the second altitude always transcends but includes the first, the third always transcends but includes the second, and so on. I'm not so sure about that, however. Sure, I can see why you'd say that an emotional state transcends a physical state, but does it always include a physical state? There are even fewer examples of this system explained than there are showing the horizontal dimension. I have no idea how I would generalize these extremely specific definitions into something that can be applied to literally any noun, which might just be the point. Maybe this system is meant as a way to get Stuart thinking about things and what it means to experience them at all of these different levels. If that's the case, translating this system into English or indeed explaining how it works to anyone in any way is impossible because what these levels of depth mean is an extremely personal thing. The following is the longest piece of text in is I could find alongside an English translation. It's a poem featured in the video The Art of Is, uploaded by Stuart Davis in 2018. There's a link to the video in the description if you're interested in hearing the specifically non-canonical pronunciation of this text. <clears throat> And you know what? Yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah, nailed it. Perfect. All in all, constructed languages are a diverse art form, and they are used for many things. An auxiliary language is a tool, a fictional language is a story, an engineered language is a demonstration. What then is is? Is is a personal language. Personal languages typically don't reach wide audiences because they typically make no efforts to advertise themselves. A personal language has a target audience of one. If is has helped specifically Stuart Davis see the world in a new way that's been beneficial to his artistic process, then is has succeeded. What criticism can I even give it without knowing Stuart at a deep personal level? I don't want to be mean. Stuart Davis isn't a public figure. Is isn't a very well-known conlang. I'd love to see Stuart make more things in is, clarify the aspects of it which are unclear clear from what he's already posted, define its grammar, post a dictionary. Is clearly means something to him that it simply cannot mean to anyone else. I say this not because I think is is beyond criticism. I do not think is is very well made from a technical standpoint, and it being a personal language doesn't negate that. Rather, is being a personal language is important context for understanding how much my opinion is worth. That said, I strongly dislike is. 
It has a couple of good ideas, but those ideas are explored more through philosophy than through conlanging. And most information that does exist about it as a language is either inaccessible or nonsensical. I do not like is, but maybe that's just because I'm judging it through tiny details posted about it during its development. As I said, I'm willing to redo this episode in the future if Stuart Davis ever publishes a full reference grammar for is. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, or I'll be reviewing Dursk. Fuck Gil. Tempo mute la mi tu li lomboca. Ni li na sinta solon tempo. Sina olin bakala. Li tawa ampa. Taso sina awem pilim pona. Fuck Gil. I want to make this sound good. And this is me trying myself to make this is this is me trying my hardest to make this sound good. It's a po it's a, I mean it's poetry. It, it should sound good. This this is genuinely me trying to make it sound good. I'm gonna I mean just like okay.